Thank you, Misty. First, I'd like to thank Elder May Bami for her opening prayer and the Plains Creed for their honor song. My name is uh, Phyllis Laurel. I'm a member of the Regina Public Library Board of Directors. It is my honor to welcome all of you to the Regina Public Library today. One of the key elements of the truth and reconciliation is public education and discussion about the history of residential schools in Canada and their lasting impact on Indigenous peoples. At RPL, we are deeply committed to creating opportunities for our community to gather and learn more about Indigenous experiences, both past and present. These can be difficult emotional conversations, but without open, honest discussion, it'll be even more difficult for us to find a way forward together. When people like Lisa Bird Wilson have the courage to tell their stories, it is our duty to listen with open hearts and minds. On behalf of myself and everyone at RPL, we are honored to hold space for Lisa and for the survivors, their families, and the children who did not survive the residential school system. Thank you for being here and for joining in this conversation. Thank you. Just a little story about residential schools to kind of lighten it up a bit. I was uh, six and a half when my dad took me to uh, Labrette and uh, my brother was going and then they were trying to drag me out of the car, but I wouldn't get out of the car. So I hung onto the steering wheel, screamed, kicked and carried on. And my dad took me home. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to school, um, the day school when it opened the following year. That's how I escaped residential school. <laughs> Thank you. See the powers of being a queen, right? Thank you, Phyllis. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for this afternoon, Lisa Bird Wilson. She is a Métis and Cree writer whose work appears in library magazines, newspapers, and anthologies across our nation. Her poetry collection, The Red Files, in 2016 is inspired by family and archival sources. It reflects on the legacy of residential school system, the fragmentation of families and history, and blows, and blows that resonate throughout the generations that still blow through our generations even now. Lisa is chair and founding member of the Anne's Cook Indigenous Literature Festival. She lives in Saskatoon and is the executive director of Gabriel Dumont, or as we call it, GDI, Canada's first Métis post-secondary education and cultural institute. Her most recent book that my mom bought for everyone and we had to read immediately because she had decided that, Probably Ruby 2021, is published internationally and was shortlisted for the Amazon First Novel Award and won two Saskatchewan Book Awards, including Book of the Year. Please welcome Lisa Bird Wilson. Dance. is a show. Good afternoon. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here in this space with you and share some time on this day with you. Um, I want to start by thanking uh, Elder May Denemy for the opening prayer that was beautiful. Um, Plains Creek Inc. for the beautiful honor song. You know, it made me a little bit emotional. <laughs> and I've got a pretty good, um, you know, like, I don't know, wh whatever you call it, uh, game face or whatever. Maybe Phyllis and I can play poker later. But uh, so, you know, today is just such a special, intense day. And I hope I don't cry. And if I do, I'm blaming you guys over there. Um, Phyllis Lara from the um, Regina Public Library uh, Board, thank you so much for your, for your opening words. And to the RPL, as I hear it is affectionately called, um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. This is such a special day to reflect and remember um, and, and, you know, just be in this moment, right? I feel very honored to have been asked to come here and speak. And I actually feel a really, I'm very nervous about this. I feel a high sense of responsibility um, for, my, for my words and my writing and what I bring forward. So I did, I was asked to um, 
to do a little bit from the red files and then I will do some more from my my newest book, um, probably Ruby. And so um, I'm going to start with the red files. And so I wrote this in about, I don't know, probably worked on it in 2013, 14, 15, part of 16. It was published in 2016. Um, and it sort of grew out of, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm part of that whole child welfare system that saw kids taken from their families and raised in white homes, in white communities, in white enclaves, as if we were alone um, and very isolating, uh, that experience. And so just figuring out where I came from and who my, who my family is, you know, um, is such an important part of my life, and it's, it's what I've really written about a lot. And so this book came from part of that examination and part of that discovery and looking at photos that had family members uh, who went to the Gordon Residential School and um, thinking about them and thinking about them as small children and feeling... Um, that that love and that empathy for them as children and what they went through. And I totally usually have a game face and I don't want to cry. So there's probably some poems in here that I can't, just can't read. I just can't do it today. Um, but it will. I do have a, a list that I intend to read. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with this one. It came, uh, so a lot of the photos, right, from residential school come from, they come from maybe staff who work there or people who work there and they've contributed them to an archive somewhere uh, and they're called the, you know, the such and such fawns. So they'll usually have the teacher's name or something associated to them and then fawns just means collection, right? Um, so a few of them that I have seen have had like <clears throat> a, a title on them um, and and then some from the community will have uh, individuals identified, right? But when you go into the archives themselves, there's no, not even an effort or an attempt to identify who the kids are. And I'm, you know, I'm just still so disturbed by that. But, you know, when I understood that when I was doing this project, um, I was, you know, I was, I was writing poetry in response to that. So this one had a title on the photo called Boys Class date unknown and you know everything that I looked at I just wanted to pick it apart and <laughs> get in there and, and figure out what's going on here what's underneath that so I'm going to read this one boys class date unknown frost breath escapes any day everyone expects first snow each boy has a poppy pinned to his left lapel above the heart reminder of the great war their face is clear cheeks like glass beads. The Reverend Canon Atwater spends considerable time setting it up. The younger boys kneel in the spiky November grass despite their good suits. The older ones, support crew, form a zigzag line behind. A latticework fence, the backdrop that almost hides the brick of the school burned to the ground in 29. As the shutter clicks, Freddie Bird tucks his head down and forward, hands clutched together in front, laughter in his chest, while Alex Musme grins out of his skin, face turned to greet the prairie sky. Little Hector on the other side of Freddie, his one knee forward, chin tilted up, anxious as if he wants in on the joke, or might tell. I'm telling you now, it's November. 1927, that time they shared a laugh, those boys at the school beside the blue slough in the heart of the Touchwood Hills. I'm just going to launch into this, this other one. So the, well, okay, now I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> so these poems come from, um, you know, my examination of these photos and I went, so I, I had these photos that had been given to me by my uncle and my auntie um, years before 
and they had these titles and they had these names on them. And, you know, there was this attempt um, that I realize now came from the community of Gordons to name the, the kids in the photos and, you know, to put some identity to that, which is really critical. Uh, so then when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came through Saskatoon, I went there and I went to the archives um, that were set up because the different church archives were set up at the at the TRC uh, events. And I asked if they had, you know, photos from this time when I had relatives there and I wanted to see if I could unearth anything else. And um, and I couldn't, they didn't, you know, I, I sort of tried. I tried there and I tried in other, other times through the national um, body. And uh, it was difficult uh, to pull that out. And I don't know if they've changed. I hope they've changed. I hope they've changed their approach, but they also had fees. So if you wanted to, and I, I, I guess I understand that they have to run in archives and pay for it, but not at our expense, I suppose. Um, so they had fees, you know, for everything you wanted to access, if you wanted copies of things, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I hope they've changed that because I don't think that's, I don't feel like that's right. Um, so this is, the, a lot of these poems are based on photos. And then as I get further into the book, they're based on uh, stories and family lore and other, other things that I found in the, in the main archives when I was working there. This one's called Girl with the Short Hair. If I wanted to describe the girl to you in a poem, I might say the short haired one, but they've all got short hair and she's more than that anyway, not just a part of the girl's class making yet another snowman or in dry summer, hanging out near the single tire swing, looking bored with something clutched in the front of her smock, one hand holding it while the other plucks at whatever it is, grass or a flower. She's not only part of this, but a breakaway, an individual. She has a name, but history hasn't recorded it. The curly haired girl then. Surely there must be something better, but really they're all so uniform in their black and white photos, oversized winter coats, sloppy cotton self-sewn dresses and smocks. More like the one with the easy stance Left shoulder dropped carelessly, as if in this restless time of year she might turn at any moment and run. But it's not what you think. It's not to run away from the school like the others, but because it's in her bones to lope under the prairie sky, to slap her feet down on the long grasses and across the short weeds that stretch endlessly for miles in all directions. Now that's more like it. There she is, the breathless one the one with the wind knotted hair. Okay, I'm gonna to stop to take a drink, so don't look. <laughs> um, okay, so how am I doing for time? I just, I wanna make sure I have time for the end because I have something planned for the end. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move a little bit into, uh, you know, there's something when you're, when you've been separated from your family and not had that access where connecting and, you know, there's a lot invested in, in belonging where you come from and realizing that later, <laughs> um, it becomes really, really important. So I wrote this poem called Descended from Daybird. And so it's, uh, I feel like I wrote something down. Oh, so it's reflecting on um, and thinking about ancestors and that notion of belonging, right? Uh, so Descended from Daybird. At the wake she sits perched in her chair, attended as an elder should be. Fine yellow skin, a fragile bloom amongst the other cookums and mushums. Spun of red silk, she is first lady of the Blue Hills. From a clan name, wing clip to bird, made and marked just so. Narrow iron eyes reaching into a look that scalds me red. Fierce flare of the nostrils, she is 
of bird women, as dainty as a dime, tapered fingers pressed to the breastbone. And another time in the city, my bandy-legged uncle laughs, head thrown back, so you can see all the way up his nostrils, two neat holes so black they say midnight. Him and all bird men, a wiry bundle of cocksure, nervous dash, gunslinger certain, calling up Daybird, who stood tall atop the Touchwood Hills, daybreak at his back, his eyes following the red belt line, Carlton tra Trail already broken by steel tracks, the trade gone dry, and white men standing like sterile hunters atop mountains of bleached buffalo skulls. Okay. Um, I had forgotten I wrote this. This is called Indian Preacher. So I was in the provincial archives. I was working on a couple of projects at one time and one of them, one of them panned out, which is this book, and one of them didn't. So, um, but I was looking at, you know, history of, of the area that was collected in the provincial archives. And there was, um, a book that had been put together. It might've been from the, like the, the, it might've been like the Punishai community or a, a church thing or something, but it was, um, you know, it was definitely not put together by indigenous people or the people of the area. It was, it was the ladies of the women's auxiliary or something like that. Um, so the, I think that they used the term Indian preacher and they were talking about Charles Pratt, uh, who it, was born in 1816. He was a ter interpreter for Treaty 4, part of, uh, Gordon's community and um, so I took I, you know I took a look at what they said which was really interesting because it was kind of like here's all about this area basically from a white perspective and then oh but we, we wouldn't it wouldn't be complete if we didn't say something about the Indians so here's what we're going to say so anyway so I wrote about you know there's actually been quite a bit written about Charles Pratt um, because he was a, a Anglican minister and uh, you know he he worked within his community for his whole life um, and so I wrote this poem based on this, you know, whatever. I've never, I don't think I've ever read it, like at a reading. Uh, but then I was going through the book and I was thinking, what am I going to read? And I realized, oh, you know what? And this is, this is exactly the symptom of being Indigenous, being adopted, being separated. Uh, you know, all of the things that colonial policy wanted to happen, right? To kids, to Indigenous kids was to get us away from our families. Well, I realized last night that um, this is actually one of my great, great, great grandparents, grandfather. Um, and so <laughs> just somebody asked me what my, because I was talking about probably Ruby in a different venue, they asked me what my homecoming was like or what my you know, reconnection with my culture was. And I said, I've, I've realized, and this just reaffirms it, that this is, I will do this for the rest of my life. I will figure out where I belong and where I come from forever. Um, so yeah, I wrote this poem without knowing that this was, you know, one of my ancestors, one of my direct, direct ancestors. Indian preacher, the ladies of the women's auxiliary sound almost tender when they write the history of the area, Touchwood, Coppell. No history would be complete without a reference to the Indians, they say as if they must explain the inclusion, apologize for their shortcomings, their failure to exclude the exclusion of exclusion. So they tell about a model of a good Indian, the Christian Indian, preaching the gospel from Indian Head to Last Mountain Lake. In the field, he is a preacher, a kind of teacher, and they say, Treaty 4 interpreter, one of the few named Indian men among countless unnamed women, men, and children of treaty. Naturally, the Lieutenant Governor of the Northwest Territories presided over the treaty signing, and he had a name. The ladies of the 
auxiliary are full of wandering footnotes and good deeds in parenthesis. Proud of their subject, he is friend of the white man, friend of the government, the Christian Indian preacher who kept Southern chiefs out of rebe Riel's rebellion. The life of the Indian preacher, content to travel with his blanket and tell his fellow Indians God is love. Quote, a true Indian, he lived a poor man, died a poor man. Surely he will have his reward in heaven. That's the way the ladies put it. Okay, I'm gonna read one more poem and then I wanna to move to probably Ruby. This poem is, are there children here? <laughs> this poem is, hi. You, you can plug your ears when I say the bad words. This poem is the only poem uh, where I use, um, I didn't write down where it is. This is the only poem I use any swear words in. And uh, I think that's, I didn't realize that until after I, I had written the book and published it. I didn't realize there was, you know, that was sort of, that's what stood out about this poem. And I think it's because there's a gut punch that goes with those swear words and it's still a gut punch for me. So it's called When Someone Remembers My Father. So when I went looking for uh, my family, looking for where I came from, uh, my father, an indigenous man from Treaty 4 territory from here, um, he had already passed away. He was killed in Prince George um, in, a, in a violent uh, manner. And so I have always sort of held that sorrow for that loss that I didn't know had happened until, you know, long after it did. So when someone remembers my father, when someone remembers my father, it's always a gift. A cousin calls him Uncle Barry. She smiles at me when she says, Uncle Barry was my favorite. And I fix on her words, charmed, someone remembers. And she says, Uncle Barry used to babysit me. I wish I could even be jealous because I can't remember except through blood and bone and the way my jaw calls up the shape of his and the narrow set of dark eyes, the flash of anger quick. He was wiry, a scrappy fighter, the night he died outside a bar, he fought the fuck out of them. Fought like fuck, man, but died just the same. I wish I could take him back, adore him, my most favorite dad ever, and say, give me a drag of your cigarette, tough guy. And he could say, watch it, kid. Okay, another drink, close your eyes. I feel like drinking out of a water bottle can, can get ugly. All right. So I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to move on. When I finished this poetry book, I knew, even as I was finishing, as I was still editing it, whatever I was doing, I was like, I just want to write fiction. <laughs> so I was so sick of poetry at that point. I just want to write fiction. I got to get back to fiction. I got to write fiction. So um, I got busy sitting down to write fiction and I drew a lot of blanks and I couldn't quite figure out what I was gonna do with that. And, um, you know, I just had to resort to this, write what you know, um, which is sort of the cliched advice for all writers, write what you know. Um, you know, I, I won't try to write about being a socialite in New York because that's just not it, right? So I started writing about being indigenous and being adopted and that, you know, that experience and trying to find sort of an avenue for doing that. And what I found was this character, Ruby. And Ruby, um, and the format I found was fiction. So I, I wrote this book about it, this novel. And Ruby for me is a character who is, she's sort of, uh, she's a lot. She's got a big personality. She's got a big laugh. She is, um, 
you know, she's really got a lot going on. And, and I loved Ruby as a character because I could take her with her big laugh, with her, uh, you know, with her, I'm going to do what I want and I don't care what you think about it. Um, and I could, I could let her just go. So Ruby is adopted an Indigenous. Ruby is a contemporary character. She's in the here and now. And I really wanted to read from Ruby because um, I wanted to end on a note that isn't, you know, it, it isn't so serious. Like I just told you about my dad dying and now I'm going to switch. I really want to switch gears and I want to give you something humorous because this day should not just be about us trotting out our trauma and somebody else consuming it. This day, Indigenous joy, right? Um, and so Ruby has nothing if she doesn't have Indigenous joy. Like she is totally that. Um, and I mean, she's got a hard life. She's got a lot of things going on, but uh, she just keeps on being Ruby and uh, just goes for it. So I hope you can just kind of let your shoulders relax and take a breath and understand that, um, you know, there's humor in this piece, even though you'll see other things there. Uh, this is intended for you to to be able to laugh, so feel free. You will not offend me whatsoever. Um, all right, so this is Ruby, and she is gone to her, I'm just gonna start here. She's gone to her counselor. She sees, sees this counselor, this is in the first chapter. She sees a counselor, his name is Cal. Ruby has this thing where she falls in love with all her counselors and then she tries to, you know, she's not really there for counseling, she's just there to see if she can get a date or whatever. Um, so she's gone, she's gone to his, she's out on her, she's on her fourth appointment and she's gone to his home office now for the first time. She's been invited to this new venue and she's quite excited about about that so I'm just gonna drop you into that that story that chapter she arrived exactly 15 minutes early she was relieved to see Cal's house wasn't smelly or desperate or worse yet too clean it looked almost ordinary as he led her inside she pointed to a yellow sombrero hanging on the wall between the kitchen and the living room nice she commented he laughed Mexico last winter I should probably take it down. Don't you dare, she said, it's the best. Hoodies on the coat pegs and sneakers near the back door provided evidence of his kids. He shared custody with his so-called ex. Once during appointment number three, when Ruby talked about her irrational devotion to Dana, Kel told her, I understand how you feel. I'm still in love with my ex. Are you? Would you go back with her, she asked. This turn of events, had it never occurred to Ruby before. They stopped in the kitchen while he finished making two cups of tea. We drank a lot of tea as kids, he said, with loads of milk. She identified drinking milky tea as a kid as a Métis thing. She loved that Cal was part Métis like her. Only she didn't grow up with her real family and she never drank tea as a kid, her mother Alice being partial to instant coffee, <clears throat> which was a completely different vibe altogether. She watched Kel pour the hot water into the teapot and longed to know more, to connect with that part of herself she'd never had. I bet you were a cute kid, she said, and filled her room with her big laugh. Kel just smiled and poured the tea. They settled into his office, which was more like an overstuffed den with couches and a big chair. She sat on the couch with its back against the wall. She noticed right away the Métis sashes draped over the end tables and along the shelf. Blown glass ornaments lined up on the sash on the shelf. More glassworks scattered on the side and coffee tables. Bowls, paperweights, ornaments, colorful blues, oranges, greens, and purples. Swirls of molten glass, hardened, shiny, and cold. On the table beside the couch sat a perfectly round glass marble, slightly smaller than a golf ball, clear glass with a purple and green flower trapped inside. Ruby knew X was an artisan, a glass blower. These must have been hers. After some general small talk, Kel asked her an unexpected question. Tell me what kind of kid you were. That's a great question, she said, a big believer in warranted compliments. She smiled a bit. He, sorry, he smiled a bit, despite himself. So, what were you like? I was a serious tomboy, she confessed. I had short hair, and I dressed like a boy, and I ran wild. 
All my friends are boys and all I wanted to do was play sports and smoke cigarettes and break shit. What do you think that was about, he asked. Cal, you're too obvious, she said. It's like I can read your mind. He blushed and she loved him even more. If Cal had noticed she was always the first one to call time on their sessions, he hadn't let on. She spent her life being told she was chosen, but constantly needing people to prove it. With Cal, she didn't want to be confronted with the fact that this was a business relationship. She didn't want him pointing out that time was up and she had to leave. She'd rather leave of her own accord. It was like breaking up. She was always the first to call it over. As they were wrapping up, Cal asked her to fill in a questionnaire about how useful the session was and how close she felt to resolving her issue on a scale of one to 10. She didn't want to give Cal a low score, so she gave it an eight, but on instant reflection, she knew that was too optimistic. She definitely thought they'd made some progress though. He invited her to his house after all. When he turned to his filing drawer to return her file, she did something she had no idea she would do. She palmed X's glass marble. As he was turning back to face her, she grabbed her bag as if she was looking for something, dropping the marble into her bag at the same time. She pulled out her bus pass and gave Cal an award-winning smile. When she left, he gave her a hug at the front door. A bit paternal, but still physical contact. She squeezed good and tight, but not sexy tight or needy tight, just I appreciate you tight. She decided to walk. Cal lived in the east end of the city, and she was in the west. She walked down one of the city's busiest arteries, full of bars, restaurants, tire shops, love shops, you name it. The day had warmed up, and she felt light on her feet. She considered whether she should text Cal and say thanks for today's session. She thought she probably would. She was feeling so good, she decided to stop at a familiar pub. It was only 4 p.m., and the place was nearly deserted. She took a seat at the bar. She ordered a pint of beer and enjoyed the first cold swallow, anticipating the spread of warmth that would let her shoulders relax and eventually fill her with curiosity and cuteness. She fished out her phone to text Cal now before she had too many drinks. Two things she'd learned to be careful about. One, she always lied to her counselors about drinking. Some of them had their own hangups about alcohol and drugs, and she didn't want any of them confusing their issues with hers. The second thing she'd learned was don't drunk text, drunk email, drunk Facebook, and so on. Best to get any follow-up to text, text to Cal out of her system now, pre-drink. But before she had a chance to do that, she sent someone occupy the bar stool next to hers. Next one's on me, said a familiar voice. She closed her eyes for just a second. Dana, oh my God, she said, as if she was not at all surprised. I was literally just talking about you. He looked confused. To my counselor, she said. Ha, huh, all good things, I'm sure, he laughed, as if they were a couple of corny business buddies out for happy hour, as if he wasn't really bad news, as if she wasn't still in love with him. Actually, I was saying how when I first met you, I wondered if your beard would give me razor burn. But then afterwards, I realized I shouldn't have worried. She laughed her spectacular laugh so he could remember what he'd been missing. He looked around the bar like he was anxious to see someone, anyone else. How you been keeping, he finally asked. That's it, she wondered, after everything. She reached out and petted his face like a chia. Beard's no worse for wear, so to speak, still soft. Yep, he said, riding his bar stool like it was a horse, leaning forward and really digging his elbows into the bar as if he hoped to hurt himself. The flash of his teeth and his full bottom lip caught her eye. She thought of the groveling she'd done, pictured herself lying down on the dirty floor so he could walk over her on his way out, envisioned his hands gripping her ribs, wrists above her head, holding her down because she told him to. She thought about calling him dirty names the whole time he was on top of her. When the bartender came by, Dana ordered another round. The bartender plunked a new pint in front of Ruby and Dana said, big head on that one. I don't mind a bit of head, she said. 
taking up her line like there had never been a break between them. You want to get out of this place, he asked. She diffused her laugh all over the bar. It's going to take a lot more than two beers to get me out of here. Marcy, you guys are wonderful. Ruby is so important for um, Indigenous women because she's so multidimensional and you see a different side of an archetype that you've all decided what Indigenous woman looks like in your head. And she defies that in many ways, but also, again, like we talked about earlier, brings back the fragmentations of where we are today, right? So thank you for giving us her. She's wonderful. Before we wrap today, Kiana Francis is here from Pipe Pop First Nations, and she is going to offer us a healing dance. My very good friend, Erin Tatusis, will introduce her and explain the significance of the Jingle Dress Dance. Oh, it's not on. Okay. All right, I'll hold it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, I'm Aaron Tatusis. Um, I'm uh, going to talk about this um, this uh, jingle dress dance here. This was a dance that was introduced to our people back in uh, back in the 1930s, 1940s. This um, there was a girl, and in, in the 1920s, 1930s, that was getting very, very sick. She was so sick that she was unable to walk. And her family was at a point of desperation where they, they were seeking treatment. They were seeking help. They were seeking spiritual help. Her father was going all over looking for help in, in, in that desperate plea. And, and within that, that time of, of searching, he, he had a dream of this dress here. And uh, he had one made and uh, he, he put it over this girl and she got well again. And uh, it was from there that this uh, that this girl grew up, and uh, also not not her. <laughs> Again, this is in the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. But this girl, this this girl grew up into adulthood, and her too had had, had similar uh, guidance like that to to pick up that dress and put it on and, and start dancing. And in her dance, she was she was able to heal people. It became known as a healing dance. And this uh, lady was named uh, this, the late Maggie White, and she comes from the Whitefish Bay area in Ontario. She made it all the way up, all the way uh, from there, all over the place, going to powwows and, and demonstrating her dance. And eventually it became a, a, another category added to the powwow. Before powwows only used to be uh, traditional and uh, women's traditional. And there were other categories added over the years, but the jingle dress dance became one of those categories. And uh, they still do a ceremony there out in the, out, out east there amongst the Anishinaabe people that uh, that is a healing dance for for many people. And uh, but we were fortunate enough for Maggie White to introduce it into powwow, and then it became a thing. It became a new a new fad that. Other other women, and she was open to other other women picking up and adopting the dance as well, because it, it became so big today that it's looked upon as, as still a healing dance, even though it's it's in, in the powwow circle. So this uh, the sound of that that dress, the sound of the drum, the sound of of uh, uh, of, the, of the, all those jingles there, are, are what uh, brings a healing effect to many people. And it's almost like it calls something and, you know, to, to activate the healing uh, spirit within, within all of us. So no, no appropriate time to bring that, that healing dance to a day like today where we're, we're thinking about, uh, you know, our past and our, our traumas and looking, for, looking towards, you know, breaking our cycles and also towards healing. And, uh, you know, we live with this every day as Indigenous peoples. You know, our, our survivors are, are, I don't really like calling them th survivors because they are really thrivers. And uh, they, they, they fought f for a lot for all of us to be here to still today. 
and uh, you know we're bringing the jingle dress dance in here to uh, to uh, to continue that. So with that, I'll uh, I'll get back to the drum here, and uh, we'll uh, we'll get uh, Kiana to 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 dance here. emotional day for a lot of us and um, my role and what I do is to take that and to carry it and to pray for all of us and our healing and our grieving and so I thank all of you for being for being here and accepting my prayer I dance for all of my people today for their healing. I dance for those who can't and I dance for those who never got the chance. And um, it's always a blessing to see my mom in the crowd and my stepdad because them too, they experienced residential school. And it's a blessing to be able to break the trauma, to break the cycles. And so I thank everybody today. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Kiana. Um, 
Um, thank you for your dance. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing teachings with us here today. And we would now like to ask um, Cook and May to come back up here and do a closing prayer for us as we wrap up our event. That brought a few tears to my eyes. Thank you, Kiana, for that for that dance. And also everyone that came here as part of TRC. It makes me so proud to see so many allies in the crowd. And I think most residential school survivors have said that um, TRC means that we need to see action behind the words to help us move on in our healing together, walking together. So with that, thank you everyone for being here and you have a wonderful orange shirt day. Egose. Thank you again to Lisa for sharing your story with us this afternoon. Thank you to Erin. Thank you to Plains Cree Inc. and Kiana. Thank you all for joining us here today. See, we're not friends. Um, reconciliation is a journey and we must all work together understanding our shared history and our truth as we make our way forward as a community. We encourage everybody here today to explore those 94 calls to action and how you can implement them in your personal and your professional spaces. We, if you've enjoyed today's events, we would like you to know that we also have more things that you can engage with with us. A screening of Enough is Enough is this afternoon at 2 p.m. in the RPL Film Theatre. Decolonizing YQR with Cadmus Delorme, Chief Cadmus, sorry, my name is SRC grade seven, but yeah, Chief <laughs> Cadmus Delorme, who will discuss what we've learned and the actions we all must take on October 18th at 7 p.m. You can find out more information on all of the events that are taking place with the RPL on their library website at reginalibrary.ca. Please take some Bannock, that's the other part. I don't know if they told you that that's here, but that's always a great thing to end with on a good day, some hearty food. Thank you all, Miigwech. Have a great afternoon. And thank you again for the RPL for always creating safe spaces for our community.